Right now, Dr. Anthony Logaba, PhD, is a board certified clinical neuropsychologist serving as associate professor at Florida Tech in Melbourne, Florida. He specializes in assessment and treatment of patients with traumatic brain injuries and concussions and memory disorders, Alzheimer's disease, or other neurodegenerative diseases or dementias. Dr. Logalbo has expertise in comprehensive assessment of neurocognitive functioning and is passionate about assisting patients with the process of recovery, emotional adjustment, and acceptance to their new state of normal following development of these injuries or diseases. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Eden, for that lovely introduction. And I'm really excited to be here talking to you guys about this topic, although I need to admit that this is a difficult topic sometimes to talk about and discuss. Um, I, I appreciate those of you here to uh, you know listen and learn more about it. Um, I, I understand it's often a, a concern that people may have for a variety of reasons uh, or that family may have uh, in, in regards to driving abilities, but also for some people, obviously something they uh, hold close to their heart and don't wanna give up. So um, I'll, I'll go ahead and mention now, the answer is not always to stop. Sometimes that is the answer, but, but sometimes that's not the answer. Um, and I think uh, hopefully as we go through this, you'll see some of the reasons, some of the issues that can come up potentially um, maybe how to uh, recognize them or address them. Um, and then eventually, for some people, unfortunately, the answer is to to call it quits, but it's not the end of the world. There are other options out there uh, that may vary a little bit depending on where you guys live, but there are some other uh, alternatives if necessary. Um, so I want to start first by just, uh, I guess, acknowledging that driving is pretty complicated. I think we take it for granted, really, and m many of you have probably been driving for decades. You know, it's almost like you don't even think about it when you drive, but it's actually a really, really complicated task. Um, you've got to be paying attention to many things at the same time, both inside your vehicle and outside. How fast am I going? What's the speed limit? How close or how far is this car in front of me or next to me? Is there someone in my blind spot? How quickly are they approaching me? Where do I need to turn to get to where I'm going? Do I need to switch lanes? Um, all different sizes of vehicles that might be around us, including sometimes motorcycles that can be even harder to detect sometimes where they are. Um, so, of course, you know, for most of our lives, we don't really think about all of that stuff. We're just driving along and we kind of take for granted that this is something that is very familiar and sort of an overlearned skill uh, for most of us uh, for a lot of our life. But it but it is really pretty complex in terms of everything that you have to be aware of and paying attention to in order to do it safely. And that's one of the main issues that. I'll be addressing in a few different ways today, being able to do it safely. This I found it's a couple of maybe years old now, but uh, I think the point still gets across, uh, which is uh, in addition to many, many folks uh, living longer than they ever used to, there's also a lot more folks uh, who are over the age of 65, uh, just in general, and also specifically on the road. Um, and in this slide suggesting it's almost double the number of people 65 and older that are driving compared to 20 years ago. And for a variety of reasons, not just Parkinson's, uh, as, as we get older, all of us, there's gonna be some changes in our health, in our physical abilities, in our sensory abilities, our vision, our hearing, reflexes, and all of these things have the potential to interfere with our ability to drive a car safely. Um, so the risk of having an injury, uh, of being involved in an accident, even if it's a minor accident, uh, increases substantially just as we get older, even if we don't have a neurological condition, just, just by virtue of our, our body and our mind aging. Um, 
I was driving uh, myself earlier today uh, to work and confronted by this huge billboard for Morgan and Morgan, which some of you may or may not know who that is although I looked up and they do have law offices in all 50 states. So wherever you are in the US, they do exist, but here in Florida, they are a prominent law firm. Uh, I'm sure if you don't have Morgan & Morgan in your town, you still probably have billboards for attorneys. And my point with that is that um, not all attorneys necessarily are looking, you know, just to make a, a buck off of folks who have uh, injuries or, or who have problems. Uh, that, that's not really what I'm trying to get at here. But um, the point is that if someone does get into an accident, often there's a, uh, a process of trying to make a decision about who is at fault or who's, at, who's responsible for that accident. And I have unfortunately seen situations where, uh, let's say you're driving down the road and someone else runs into you, not your fault, they hit you. Well, police will show up and they'll start asking questions and uh, maybe they, you know, give, give someone a ticket and you end up going home and later on, uh, someone may contact an attorney about the accident um, if they happen to find out, oh, well, this person who was involved in the accident, maybe they have some memory problems. Maybe they have some physical problems. Maybe they have difficulty with their reflex or their reaction time is not quite as good as it used to be. Maybe they have something like Parkinson's disease. Someone will ask the question, should that person have been driving in the first place? And I've seen situations where the person who technically was not at fault for the accident, someone else ran into them, but they could still potentially get sued and be held financially responsible for the accident, even though technically they were not at fault. And the theory there, the reason or rationale, is that they shouldn't have been driving in the first place because they had a condition that should have prevented them from driving. I'm not saying that that's going to happen every single time in a court of law, but I have seen that happen. So there is a financial risk of getting behind the wheel, even if you aren't at fault. And folks like Morgan and Morgan, not to harp on them too much, uh, sometimes are behind the scenes in, in, in pushing that forward. So that is something I like to mention and, and make people aware of um, uh, that that is a risk. But let's talk a little bit more about why, why there might be some challenges or difficulties with driving specifically among folks who have Parkinson's, I think the most obvious one that most people perhaps think of has to do with their physical symptoms. If someone has tremor, uh, rigidity, uh, maybe slow movements, slow reaction time, um, that could potentially create some challenges in terms of responding quickly in a, in a motor vehicle type of situation. Um, and that is definitely a piece of it. But the other piece, and the piece that's a little closer to what I uh, spend most of my time doing, has to do with our cognitive abilities, our thinking abilities, um, our ability to pay attention and concentrate or pay attention to multiple things going on at the same time, uh, shifting back and forth, paying attention to our speedometer, and then looking up and paying attention to how far that car is away from me in the next lane, being able to shift our thinking, our concentration back and forth like that is also something that sometimes can become a challenge or more difficult, both as we get older in general, but also sometimes uh, for, for some people, at least who have Parkinson's disease as well. So, um, 
to get into a little bit more specific and some of this information, I should say, I actually took from an article that was recently published on this very issue of driving and Parkinson's disease, uh, a research paper. Um, so again, some of this may not be too surprising, but just for the sake of being clear about it, uh, motor symptoms may interfere with a lot of uh, the physical aspects of literally driving the car, turning the steering wheel, pushing down with the with your foot on the brake or the gas pedal, uh, reacting quickly to changes, especially unexpected changes that can sometimes occur when you're driving down the road, whether it's all of a sudden there's a piece of debris in the middle of the road and you have to swerve out of the way. Um, maybe there's a road sign or some construction going on, even if it's a route that you've been down many, many times before and you're very familiar with, but on this particular day, there's some construction there that that is new and you hadn't seen before. And maybe you have to switch lanes or there's cones in the way or something like that. Any of those kind of changes in the environment that require us to respond quickly or differently than we normally would, uh, motor symptoms can potentially interfere with. Some of the cognitive difficulties I mentioned already some of them in terms of reaction time and speed, um, but I also put this into the, that category having to do with our, not vision, not in terms of your eyeballs, but your perception of what you see. When information comes into our eyes, where does it go? Well, it goes into our brain and then our brain processes that information. And even if our eyeballs are working perfectly or if we have corrective lenses and we can see clearly, our brain may be processing that information incorrectly. And sometimes that can happen with respect to judgment of how far away things are. Or another fancy phrase for that, I guess, is depth perception. Uh, can, how do our, our ability to judge how close or how far away are we from other vehicles or other objects? For example, if we're trying to park our car, um, this becomes really important or else you might have uh, hit your fender, you know, on, on a post or something like that. Um, so the other cognitive abilities that I've kind of addressed, trouble concentrating, paying attention, um, decision making, especially fast decision-making, um, multitasking, paying attention to more than one thing at a time. Um, not everybody who has Parkinson's disease will experience all of these things, but these are things that sometimes people may experience. Um, to, to some degree, anybody might, experiencing, might experience them. Um, we all maybe have off days and, and we're not fully paying attention as well as we normally might. But these things become a little bit more common or frequent with some folks who have Parkinson's disease, given the way that it can affect how our brain processes information at times. Now, some of you may also know what I'm going to show you here next. Medications. Uh, I have yet to find a medication that has zero side effects. Um, if anybody finds one, let me know. Uh, but most of them do. <laughs> and some of the medications that people pay, take for Parkinson's, again, you probably know this better than I do, uh, can cause some symptoms like these, drowsiness, sleepiness, or feeling tired, fatigued, uh, dizziness, lightheadedness, blurred vision, or just feeling kind of confused and out of it. Well, those are not good things to be experiencing if you're trying to drive a car down the road. Uh, with a bunch of traffic around, it can really interfere with your ability to do so for anybody. Um, and so, again, you probably are way more familiar than I am with how your medications affect you. But I know some people who maybe they don't stop driving completely, but if they know that within an hour of taking their medication, they're going to experience some of these symptoms, they won't drive during that time when the medication is causing some of these side effects, uh, just to take that extra bit of safety. 
Now, I often, you know, get asked this question. Um, I myself, I'm a neuropsychologist, and some of you may or may not know what that means. But I'll tell you this: it's something that I do not do is do a driving evaluation with somebody on the road. I don't get into a car and drive and and evaluate someone's ability to actually drive their vehicle. There are some people who do that, and I'll get to that in a minute. But that's not something that I do. Uh, so people often ask me then, well, if, if you don't do that, how can you make a decision about whether someone can drive or not? And part of the reason is that we know some things about uh, people who have taken some of those driving tests, the on-road driving tests. And again, I saw this, uh, I just read this research article uh, a few days ago. This isn't one that I published, but one that I read a few days ago. And I thought some of these statistics were interesting and I wanted to share them with you. This is an on-road driving test. So, you know, you actually are in a car driving down the road and someone who evaluates your abilities is sitting right there next to you. Up to half of people with Parkinson's disease failed that driving test across a few studies that they examined here. Now, it's also interesting to note that same aged people who did not have Parkinson's disease, up to a quarter of them also failed in the driving test. So I kind of said before, as we get older, um, we're going to start to have some physical, sensory, cognitive changes that are going to affect, potentially affect our ability to drive a car. Even if we don't have Parkinson's disease, that's true. But if you have Parkinson's disease, the chance of those things happening is increased. It's not 100%, but it's about double, roughly, depending on how you look at these numbers. Um, almost twice as many people with Parkinson's disease had trouble with this on-road driving test compared to people that were the same age but didn't have Parkinson's disease. So what are some of the things that you might see or when they're doing these on-road tests, what are some of the problems that um, maybe people would encounter? Well, I already mentioned one of them, which is something like this. I'm trying to park my car in a parking spot, but if I'm having trouble judging distance, how far away things are, I might really over or underestimate how far that car is or how far I need to turn into this parking spot. Fortunately, in this case, it looks like they didn't hit the other car. Maybe they did slightly, um, but that's definitely something that can happen because of that difficulty with our perceptual abilities. And again, here, I'm not talking about your vision. You can go to the eye doctor. They may give you glasses. They might say, hey, with these glasses, your vision is perfect. That's all well and good, but here what I'm talking about is your brain's ability to interpret the information coming in from your eyes. So your eyes or you know might be fine or your vision might be fine, but the part of your brain that's processing that information, if the wires get crossed back there, it can cause problems with depth perception that can really be a problem in situations like this where you it's important, it's very, very important to be able to judge distance accurately. Kind of a similar concept, uh, but in this case, this person's driving down the road. I know this isn't the best image, but it's the uh, only one I could find that kind of illustrated what I'm trying to show, this car sort of veering off into another lane. If you can see that there, maybe I can use this laser pointer to kind of point it out. Um, and this is another uh, somewhat common problem that can happen really either in this case on the interstate when you're traveling at higher speeds, but also sometimes sometimes it's actually worse when people are driving at lower speeds, um, maintaining your position within a lane. Uh, may not sound like it's that hard. You just hold the steering wheel and in one position, you're just going straight. But as Again, probably a lot of you know from, from your experience driving, sometimes you don't have to 
move the wheel, the steering wheel too much, and you'll already start drifting one way or the other. And uh, sometimes people may not catch that until they're already in someone else's lane, like in this example here. Um, again, this could happen just as easily or maybe even more often when you're just on local roads in your town. Um, certainly could also happen on an interstate when you're going faster, but but it happens very frequently in at lower speeds and, and on smaller roads uh, as well. And so situations like these can sometimes lead to minor scrapes or dents or maybe even things like this, <laughs> uh, mirrors uh, hitting the side of another vehicle and, and breaking off like that, um, and, and some minor kinds of scrapes and things that sometimes can show up uh, on a vehicle. And so uh, if for those of you who maybe um, are, are joining us in your family members or caregivers or friends of folks uh, that you're concerned about that might have some driving difficulties. These are some of the minor things that sometimes we might look for to see uh, if there are some difficulties or concerns potentially about someone driving. If you see evidence uh, of these minor collisions or, or minor uh, accidents um, that may have happened like this. Um, that research paper that I mentioned, I thought there was one other thing in there that I thought was kind of interesting to note, which during those on-road exams, <clears throat> the uh, people that were conducting those evaluations made a note of how frequently people with, uh, well, any of the people that, that they were examining checked their mirrors for blind spots whether it was their side mirror or their rear view mirror. And they found that people with Parkinson's disease tended to check their mirrors less often compared to other folks. Um, so that's another just kind of safety tip, you know, um, whether they forgot, whether, you know, whatever the reason might have been, they were distracted. Um, but sometimes double or triple checking our mirrors for safety and to help us judge distance uh, is a really important thing to do. Um, and just a reminder, I guess, to, to, to make sure we do that. <laughs> um, so another example, a uh, common one actually, um, that I wanted to mention uh, with respect to misjudging distance is a scenario like uh, is demonstrated here. This is probably one of the more problematic uh, kind of situations where you're driving down the road. Let's say you're in this red vehicle that has an A on it, and you're wanting to make a left turn across traffic that's heading in the opposite direction that's coming at you. Um, again, this is something all of us have probably done hundreds and hundreds of times, right? Um, but it's actually one of the more challenging things to do because you're having to judge how far away is car B, how fast are they traveling, do I have enough time to turn in front of them without them hitting me or, or having to slam on their brakes and maybe have some interesting words to yell out the window at me. Um, so again, we've all done this many times, you know, make that left turn across traffic like this. Um, but it is a really complicated thing to do uh, in terms of the amount of information, bits of information that we have to process and take in to make that decision about whether we have enough time to scoot in front of this guy or should we wait and let them pass and, and, and look for a bigger opening to come along. Um, so that's, again, another example of having to judge multiple things toward making that decision that could really, uh, again, if the wrong decision is made, could potentially be quite uh, catastrophic in terms of a collision and, and an injury, especially if car B is going at a high speed. Um, so I, I've mentioned this phrase a few times, I think, multitasking or paying attention to multiple things at the same time. Um, 
and, and in particular, uh, you know, I've been talking about it in the context of all the things we have to do when we're driving. But there's also a number of things that maybe some of us do that don't involve driving. Um, even if it's something as simple, not not like this picture here, he's got a lot going on. Uh, but even if it's something that sounds as simple as listening to the radio, all cars, uh, I believe, almost all cars at least, still have radios or some kind of uh, music that you can listen to when you're driving. Um, again, you've probably done that many, 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 many times. Uh, or have a conversation, whether it's on the phone or maybe there's someone sitting next to you uh, or in the vehicle with you. Um, but that little bit of distraction where you're listening or paying attention to something else that doesn't involve driving at all, um, maybe, you know, 90% of the time we're able to do that fine. But there is occasions where um, that may pull our, our attention away just enough that we're not focused as well on driving, which is the main thing that we're supposed to be doing, right? Um, and if we're having some trouble with paying attention anyway, then trying to have these other things going on, conversation, listening to something on the radio, it's going to make it even harder to stay focused and pay attention to everything that we need to pay attention to while we're driving. Um, the solution to this is kind of simple then too, right? Just don't turn the radio on, turn it off. Um, or if someone's in the car with you and they want to have a conversation, maybe ask them, hey, you know, I'm trying to concentrate on driving here. Can we finish this conversation or talk about it more once we reach our destination? Um, so there are things to try to minimize that distraction there. Um, and again, this is something that we've all done. We, we've all driven down the car while having a conversation. We've all driven our car while listening to music. But just be aware, it may be enough to pull our attention away slightly that creates a more hazardous situation. Sometimes it might be better to turn off or, or stop that other distraction so that we can really focus on what we're doing. Now here's a real, oh, oh yeah, okay. I put this little puppy in here because I knew I was gonna forget to mention this. And that is that some people also drive with their pets in the car. <laughs> and while that might be really cute and you might wanna take your pet everywhere and that's not necessarily a problem, they can sometimes be distracting too. They, you know, if they're sitting on your lap, especially they can really be distracting sometimes and, and that can be a safety issue as well. I'm glad I put that in there or else I would have forgot that little guy. Okay. Uh, so here's a scenario that uh, I came across this image and uh, thought it was pretty powerful um, because none of us really would expect something like this to happen. You're driving down the road and all of a sudden uh, a child uh, runs out into the middle of the street in front of you, maybe chasing a toy or a ball, uh, like in this picture, how it shows. Um, none of us would be, would expect that to happen. Uh, that doesn't mean it can't happen. Um, and it could happen to any of us, really. I mean, I live in a neighborhood with a, a lot of families and, and children, and so this could just as easily happen in my neighborhood as, as yours or anywhere else. Um, the issue, though, about this that I want to mention is um, while that could happen to anybody, if my ability to respond quickly and react uh, is is less than perfect in that moment, that can be the difference between this being a real serious issue and a near miss. <laughs> um, you know, I, again, anybody could encounter that and it could potentially uh, go wrong for anybody if it does happen. Um, but in thinking about when might it be time for me to retire from driving, one of the issues that I would think about in that situation is, am I as safe in a situation like that as I used to be? Am I as safe in a situation like that as most people 
people who don't have maybe whatever the condition or limitation is that I might have. Um, I, I would probably, either way, I would probably feel very guilty if I was the one driving and something like that happened. But if, but if it was due to something that I maybe could have prevented, I think I would feel even worse, you know, if that were to happen to me. And not to necessarily harp on this too much, but I saw an, a, another image here. Uh, Eden, I know we were talking about this. I don't know if you've seen this one. I thought it was funny. Um, so, <laughs> uh, yes, remember, as I mentioned before, uh, there's folks out there who, again, not, not necessarily suggesting that they're trying to exploit the situation. This is their job. Um, but if something like that happens and they find out, oh, the person who is driving this car had a neurological disorder that might interfere with their ability to drive, uh, you can be pretty sure that an attorney is going to look at that and say, this is a way to add to my cool $15 billion recovered. Um, and, and like I said, in addition to the potential safety concerns involved, um, it would be a, a tragedy, I think, for someone to go through a lawsuit like this and financially be crippled because of something that happened. So that's just another angle of this. It's not just about safety. That's a big piece of it. But there's also a financial risk that can come into play. And, and I want to stress that point to you guys as well. Sometimes even if you, uh, like I said before, even if you really didn't do anything uh, wrong, uh, there can still potentially be a financial risk. So I mentioned this before, uh, warning signs, <laughs> mysterious scrapes or dings that appear and, and we don't know how they got there. Um, you know, if it just happens once, that that may be something that could happen to a lot of folks. But if it's happening multiple times, these can be suggestions that there are some difficulties uh, along the lines of some of the things that I've mentioned, particularly judging distances or speed um, that can create some of these minor scrapes or dents in certain areas of the vehicle. So what are some ways to try to compensate for these things or try to address them? Like I said before, sometimes maybe the answer is stop driving, but not always. So what else can be done, um, you know, besides stopping completely? I mentioned a couple of these, one, eliminating distractions or reducing those distractions so that when we're driving the vehicle, we're really able to focus on the things that we critically need to focus on from a safety standpoint. Um, some people may avoid driving in certain situations, like at night when it's dark and our ability to see things might be restricted. Uh, some people might stick to local places, familiar routes. Um, they just go to a few places maybe that they've been to many, many times, and they try to use roads that have relatively less traffic, you know, or not driving during rush hour when there's a lot more cars on the road. Um, and some of it may be about, uh, from a physical standpoint, maintaining good posture sitting up straight so that you can see more clearly and trying to help in terms of your reaction time or your reflexes to be uh, as uh, on point, as accurate as possible. I mentioned before too about your medications. If you know that a medication tends to make you drowsy or feel kind of spacey, foggy minded, um, Driving when you've just taken your medication may not be the best idea. So timing, when am I going to drive around when you take your medications? Sometimes I know some patients, some people that do that. And like I said before, if they know the medication is going to affect them a certain way, they just won't drive then. They'll find another way or they'll drive another time. And a lot of people now use GPS uh, or some other kind of navigation system, particularly if you're going places you haven't been before to try to help with that. I think it 
can be helpful. Sometimes it's not always accurate in my experience, but um, but it can be uh, helpful uh, at least in terms of um, assisting with directions so that you're not having to you know look at a map or something at the same time. Um, although I also know a lot of people uh, will have a, a navigator, basically someone else in the vehicle who will help them with the instructions and, and directions of how to get somewhere so that at least you have some assistance with, with that part. And that's another way to, to do this as well. Um, I often do recommend too, as I mentioned before, I myself, I don't get into a car and, and evaluate people's driving abilities, but Sometimes, uh, I, uh, well, a lot of times, really, I will ask uh, a family member or a friend of the person um, that I'm seeing what if they've noticed anything. Yeah. And, and occasionally they might have some input. They might be able to say, oh, yeah, I drive with them or I ride in the car with them. And, and I haven't noticed any problems. Um, sometimes they might say, uh, that they have noticed some issues. And occasionally they might say, I don't know, I've never ridden with them, um, you know, or I stopped riding with them five years ago because they made me really scared. Uh, so if you can find someone <laughs> who's willing to ride with you, sometimes that's uh, a another strategy because we aren't always aware of some of the difficulties that we may have um, and sometimes another person, someone that you trust or that knows you well, they may be able to observe things that we may not see. Uh, so, you know, if you have someone that, that rides with you routinely, they may have a good handle on that. But I have met a few people who there just isn't someone that rides with them regularly. Um, doesn't mean there couldn't be, though. And sometimes that's a helpful piece of information to have someone else's input on uh, your your driving ability or if they're noticing any concerns. And I mentioned before, there are, though, people whose job it is to do a driving evaluation. So those folks exist as well. Um, I'm not talking here about the people at the DMV. Uh, they do driving evaluations, but the, that driving evaluation is more just to make sure that uh, you know the rules of the road and you can get your license. That's not what I'm talking about here. <clears throat> there are actually people, mostly occupational therapists, who have received additional training to evaluate safety in driving among people who have certain medical or physical conditions and limitations. Um, I just happen to find this group. I, I have no affiliation with them. I can't vouch for them. Um, but this is uh, an agency or organization that I think has multiple locations around the United States. Maybe they have one near you or maybe there's something like it near you. Um, these are people who are trained specifically to do a, a driving evaluation in a vehicle. You know, so they sit next to you like in this picture. Um, they go over certain things, uh, maybe in the office, but then they do actually get you on the road in a vehicle and they drive uh, with you or ride with you and evaluate different aspects of your um, ability to be aware of safety issues in a, in a car. So occasionally I have recommended this to, to people. I know neurologists or other physicians have recommended for some patients to have a driving evaluation. Um, and this is something that, you know, if there's enough concern or sometimes if the person believes that everything's fine, but but their family has concerns, this is a way that you can show them. You can prove that your driving is fine uh, or maybe not, uh, you know, like they don't guarantee how the results are gonna go, but but the proof is in the pudding, so to speak, um, you know, and having a driving evaluation sometimes is uh, an important step to ensure that someone is able to do it safely. Now, one thing that I haven't hit on too much here, maybe I briefly referenced this idea toward the beginning, um, you know, we are talking about safety and, and some of the issues that can come up with driving, but one of the biggest, um, I think, challenges or reasons why people don't want to stop driving, they don't want to give it up, has to do with losing independence. 
And so this is obviously a big uh, point of contention and something that I talk with folks about quite a bit. This balance between how do I maintain my independence and, and my mobility and getting around and doing the things that I want to do while also considering the safety aspect of what we've been talking about so far today. Um, and it's a difficult thing to balance. It's a diff difficult equation. Um, you know, in, in my experience, I think there are definitely some situations where it's quite obvious, quite, quite clear that someone should not be driving anymore. Maybe there are also situations where it's pretty obvious that someone's okay to drive. And then there's other situations where it's really a gray area. It's hard to say. Um, but that safety issue is something that I always keep in mind. And uh, I often feel like I'm asked to predict the future in the sense that, you know, well, how likely is it that someone is going to have an accident or, or how likely is it that someone's going to be able to continue to drive safely for another year or two years or five years or whatever? Well, I don't have a crystal ball. <laughs> I can't predict the future. I, and I don't know the answer to that. But what I do know is uh, that Parkinson's disease, unfortunately, uh, is a progressive illness. And it's likely that uh, some abilities are going to get worse as time goes on. And so even if someone's able to drive pretty well right now today, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be able to drive just as well in six months or a year, things might change. And so if there are safety concerns, even if right now they're kind of minor, I don't want to wait until you have an accident. I don't want to wait until a child chases a ball into the road in front of you and, and something tragic happens. I don't want to wait until there's a disaster. If there are enough concerns from a safety standpoint now, it's better to stop before we get to that tragic event rather than, well, let's just gamble, which is basically what it's doing here. You're gambling to wait and see what might happen. And again, not just from a safety standpoint, but this can also be a financial burden for a lot of people in terms of uh, potentially being sued and held financially responsible for an accident that, that uh, takes place. So what are some other options. Um, some of these, you know, kind of obvious. Maybe you have a friend or a family member, maybe even someone who lives with you, who does most of the driving anyways, <laughs> um, and would be more than happy to take you wherever you need to go. Um, I know sometimes people feel like they don't want to be a burden, they don't want to have to ask someone uh, you know, for a, for a drive somewhere. Um, they feel like they're inconveniencing folks. Um, and maybe sometimes that, that could happen. But I think that a lot of times, uh, you might be surprised. People might be more than, more than happy to help you, especially if you plan ahead, if you ask them in advance, you know, if it's a last minute thing, that might be harder for people to juggle. But if you know that there's something coming up, whether it's a doctor's appointment or some event that you want to attend, um, then arranging for someone, a family member, a friend to, to give you a lift and drive you somewhere, for a lot of people, that's that's an easy option. Um, we don't have too much of this here where I live, but in some towns, some cities, maybe where some of you live, public transportation might be a good option. Um, maybe uh, a taxi or Uber or Lyft, some kind of hired service for transportation. Um, some of you may live in a retirement community where they have a, a shuttle van or something like that that can take you places. Um, so not all of these resources are going to apply to everybody. I understand that, but, um, sometimes you got to explore what the options are in your community where you live and what's going to be the best option for you. Uh, but I think the key really with a lot of this is planning ahead, looking into the options ahead of time, 
Um, but majority of the time, um, finding someone or some method of getting around, it's not impossible if you stop driving. I understand, again, it, it, does, a, it does restrict your independence and it's always going to feel that way to a degree, but there often are some other options uh, to explore. So, again, I don't know how many folks on here might be more in the role of, uh, of a caregiver or a family member, <clears throat> but I did want to just mention a couple of things that can sometimes be helpful in terms of how do I even bring up this conversation? <laughs> you know, again, I appreciate you all being here and, and being interested in this topic, um, but it is a very difficult thing to bring up uh, and, and to discuss. Uh, even for doctors, I'll, I'll say, you know, it's 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 not a it's not always a easy conversation to have um, about whether someone's driving safely and whether they should stop or at least limit their driving. Um, so we've covered a couple of these things. Observe. Watch, look for look for any problems. Maybe there aren't any, um, but look for signs of any kind of damage on a vehicle. Uh, recent accident tickets. Um, some people may themselves automatically sort of start to limit or restrict their driving to certain conditions. Um, so look for changes in someone's driving behaviors that might suggest that they're becoming a little more anxious or cautious about driving. And then when bringing it up or talking about it, I think uh, the the key really is to try to remain supportive and not make it sound confrontational, um, avoiding, you know, um, making negative comments um, and trying to remain understanding and sympathetic with the idea that this is a hard thing to deal with. It's not easy for hardly anybody to stop driving or give it up. Most people don't want to do that. Um, and, it, and it is going to be crummy. It's going to have an impact, you know, on, on, on someone's ability to get around and do things. So acknowledging that this is a difficult thing, it's a hard pill to swallow, but at the same time, emphasizing the safety issues. I care about you. I care about your safety. I care about other people's safety. I don't want to get into a situation where somebody could be hurt. Um, I don't want to get into a situation where we get sued and we have to sell our house because we can't afford the bills. Um, you know, things like that, um, I think, can sometimes be a way to at least initiate some of that conversation, even though it's still, yes, definitely a difficult one to have. Um, and I'll mention this, too. Uh, because I think it's important, you know, many people will say, well, I've always been a good driver. I've never gotten a ticket before. You know, I'm, I'm an excellent driver. I've never even been pulled over. Um, and that might be absolutely true. We're not talking here about your driving ability. We're talking about a, a medical condition that's interfering with your ability to operate the vehicle safely. Your, your driving ability in terms of what you've learned and done for most of your life, that's not the issue. The issue is a physical or a cognitive limitation caused by a medical condition that's interfering with doing this safely. And it's kind of a separate separate concept. So I absolutely believe when people tell me they've always been a good driver, I'm sure that's true. It's not about whether you're a good driver or not. It's about whether we can do it safely given your current status. Um, maybe I'll end by just showing this uh, picture here that I found that was kind of funny, the wheels of life. <laughs> um, I know it might be a little hard to see, but kind of goes through the different stages. Uh, I thought was kind of a funny cartoon to share. So thank you all for your time. I, I really appreciate your attention and the opportunity to speak with you about this. 
Um, I do want to did save a few minutes for some questions if there are any, but um, thank you again. I appreciate your attention. Thank you, Dr. Ogalba. I, I, I appreciate this. That's actually very funny to me as I'm looking at the wheels of life. Um, so we just had some comments and stuff. Um, one thing we actually will be doing, because somebody had said, like, hopefully one day we'll have self-driving vehicles. We actually are going to be doing a program next year. Um, should have the hearse last. Um, we'll be doing a program next year with an occupational therapist, and we will be talking a little bit about autonomous vehicles. Because as Dr. Logobo mentioned, this is a hard conversation to have. This is someone's independence. Um, you know, if I said to you, hey... We need to fix your diet. I need you to give up carbs. You wouldn't be happy with me, but you could survive. You'd be okay versus saying, hey, I need you to stop driving because that is, that's how you get around. That is your independence. Um, you kind of touched on some signs. Is this something that you would kind of, if you were in this situation, would you kind of look at the car, you know, kind of like, your loved one just got back. How how do you kind of handle, you know, keeping people safe and doing this? You're on mute. There you go. Yeah. Uh, how do I handle that? Well, I mean, it's, uh, it's tough. I, I think, you know, the first part is trying to start the conversation. I, I feel like a lot of times um, when I uh, bring this topic up with people, they may not, um, it may not have been broached before, like no, nobody may have even brought it up or started to talk about it yet. So, um, you know, I, I try to come at it gently initially, uh, pointing out the concerns. Um, and in some cases, like I said, I think the, the goal isn't to immediately stop. Sometimes the goal is to uh, restrict or limit, particularly trying to avoid situations that are the most risky uh, or most concerning or threatening. Um, and if I can at least get someone to see that that's a good idea <laughs> uh, to, to try to limit things to reduce risk, then I'm I'm moving someone in the right direction, um, you know, along this scope. Like a lot of things, when we're trying to change behavior, change a behavior that we've been doing for a long, long time, it's hard to change all of a sudden. Um, and so sometimes the goal is to gradually work towards something rather than abruptly stopping uh, right away. Um, but you know, I think uh, not always, but a lot of times having a, a rational discussion about it and, and just explaining the concerns, sometimes are, people are able to see or, or resonate with that. Um, it's when people don't have that awareness and, and even when you point out that there's damage to their vehicle or, or things that have happened and they're still really resistant to, to even considering a change, that's when it can become a lot uh, more difficult to manage, I think. This is a question that has come up several times in support groups. Um, some states will actually ask, do you have a condition when driving? Um, mm -hmm. Not all states do. Is this something you do need to disclose to the DMV when you go and reapply? Um, is this kind of mm -hmm. a little, there's no real cut and dry answer. It's kind of, you know, what is your, your thought on that? Yeah. So there's a couple issues there. I, I mean, I think first, um, uh, as you mentioned, uh, I live in Florida. In Florida, there is not a requirement for people to undergo a driving evaluation after a certain age. Um, but some states do have that. Uh, I was born in Chicago. A lot of my family lives in Illinois. My grandmother, uh, she's passed away now, but I remember when she was uh, getting older, 
she was required at some point to have a driving evaluation. I don't remember if it was every year or every two years. Um, so I know some states do require that. So that is one one piece of, of your question. But the other piece of your question is, are you required to disclose? Um, I mean, I, I would say basically, yes. However, if you don't disclose it and an accident happens, John Morgan is going to call you <laughs> um, or, or someone like him. And, and that was kind of the point that I was trying to make. You know, I don't want to uh, belabor it really, but it is an important one. If, you, if it's not disclosed and something happens, then it becomes a liability. So do you have to do it? You know, I guess that depends on your own personal ethics and, and whether you want to disclose information or not. But but if an accident occurs, and, and keep in mind, even if someone runs into you, there's still a possibility that your diagnosis could become known. And if people become aware that you have Parkinson's disease, an attorney is going to ask that question, should you have been driving in the first place? And if they come to the conclusion that the answer to that question is no, you should not have been driving in the first place, then the person who ran into you can sue you and potentially they can win. I'm not saying that's going to happen 100% of the time, but I have seen that happen. So, so do you have to disclose? I, I don't know. I would suggest that you do disclose it. But if you don't, be aware there is a financial liability there in the event of an accident, even if you're not at fault. What about if you did have somebody review your skill set, like you you had a driving rehab specialist? Does that help with the liability at all? If, if somebody else says, hey, this person is okay to drive despite having part, does that help offset at all? Uh, well, I'm not an attorney, so I can't give uh, legal advice, really. But I, I would imagine that uh, the answer is at least partially yes. Um, it probably will depend uh, on how long ago that evaluation was, you know, as I mentioned, and as as we I think all know, Parkinson's is a is a progressive disease, and so if I had a driving evaluation done last month and I passed, that might carry some weight. But if I had a driving evaluation done five years ago, it may no longer be valid. So. Um, so I think it depends on how recent the evaluation was done. And I see we're getting some questions maybe about how frequently, um, may, maybe every year. You know, I think each person is going to be a little bit different uh, potentially. But but yeah, I could see a yearly basis. Um, in, in some places, though, I, I should also probably mention that uh, the on-road driving evaluations usually are not something that's covered by insurance. Usually these are things that people have to pay out of pocket for. Um, they can cost a few hundred dollars, I understand. And again, there's no guarantee that you're going to pass. So if you pay for the evaluation and you don't pass, that means you have to stop driving. So some people are hesitant to even do the driving evaluation for that reason. But in full disclosure, that is how that works. And, and if you don't pass, I believe in some places, at least, they are obligated to disclose that to the DMV if you don't pass the evaluation. I know it's a lot to... No, this has been incredible. We've gotten so much good information. Uh, multiple questions about will this be available so we can rewatch. Yes, this will be available. And Kelly has put the link in the chat. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us today, Dr. Ogalvo. As always, we have a tradition here in PMD Alliance, our wave of gratitude. Thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate it. You're welcome. 
thank you again for the opportunity to chat with y'all. Hope you found it helpful and interesting and I hope to have another chance to meet with you as well. Of course. Everybody have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.